Okay, good, uh, good afternoon. And uh, first of all, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as a part of a series we've been doing in the Pegasus Priority Program, uh, today we have uh, a special guest uh, that's gonna help us uh, have a moderated conversation with Carrie on uh, sexual harassment and sexual assault. And this is one of the things that's been plaguing our formations uh, over the last several years. So we really appreciate uh, Dr. Orchowski taking the time to, uh, to come and be a part of this for us and help us walk through this program today. So I'll turn it back over to Carrie and say once again, thank you uh, for joining us. And I look forward to hearing your feedback on how, uh, how you thought this was helpful. Over to you, Carrie. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, my name is Carrie Irvin. And on behalf of our team with the 82nd Combat Aviation Brigade's Pegasus Priority Program, I do wanna welcome you and thank you for joining us today for our session entitled, What Works in Sexual Assault Prevention? Um, before we get started, I do want to let you know that this session is being recorded. Um, so as with all of our other sessions, you will be able to find this on the 82nd CABS YouTube channel. Um, we'll also put the slides and other resources there available for you as well, uh, but it will be public. So with that being said, I want to invite anyone who might have concerns about being able to participate in this conversation because we do want this to be an interactive conversation with free flow and dialogue. Uh, we invite you to turn off your cameras if you're more comfortable. You can also go up and rename yourself. If you're not familiar with how to do that on Zoom, it's very simple. Go to the box that has your picture or name in it. Click at the top right corner, you have three dots. Click that, scroll down to rename and go ahead and name yourself whatever you feel comfortable with, anonymous, whatever, um, but keep it clean, please. Uh, so looking at the registration, I'm really heartened by the fact that I see such a cross section of so many people representing the different branches of our entire military service, as well as our military support personnel and family members. Um, this is fantastic because what we're gonna be talking about today is how we all, every single one of us has a part to play and has the ability to help shift community norms. Um, so you all, because you're here, I, I guarantee that you've all been hearing a lot about sexual assault um, and sexual harassment in our military communities. But this is not a new problem. What is new is the fact that more and more leaders throughout the ranks, more teammates and more family members are stepping into the void to say, no more, not in my unit and not in my community. They're looking for ways to protect one another from our little groups of paratroopers up to our division commanders. Sexual assault and sexual harassment prevention has become a public health focus with the target of shifting our community norms so that every person is educated and provided skills on how to stop it before it ever happens. Um, much of this shift is going to come from people like yourselves people who are taking the time to learn from the research, who are looking at participating in dialogues and wanting to take action to stop sexual assault and sexual harassment so that they are no longer thought of as only a criminal justice matter. Our guest today will explain to us the most effective steps that we can take backed by research to create safer work and community environments for us all. And with that being said, I am going to introduce to you our guest. Let's see. So Dr. Lindsay Orschowski is a clinical psychologist at, Long, or at Rhode Island Hospital. She is um, a leading expert in the development and evaluation of sexual assault and sexual harassment programs. Uh, she is a cl staff clinical psychologist um, she is an associate professor at the Alpert Medical School of Brown University. And Dr. Orchowski has published over 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers and chapters addressing sexual assault. She's the co-editor of three books, Engaging Boys and Men in Sexual Assault Prevention, Sexual Assault Risk Reduction, The Theory, Research, and Practice, Engaging, or I'm sorry, and health and behavior norms, social norms, the theory, research, and strategies for change. Strategies for change. We are so glad that you were here today to talk with us about just that, Dr. Ochowski. 
what prevention and intervention strategies we can take to affect change and the why behind their necessity. So Dr. Lindsay Orchowski, I would like to thank you for being with us today and uh, welcome you to the Pegasus Priority Program. And with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the presentation over to you. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna pull up my slides. Okay, I'll look for um, a thumbs up from Ms. Amber Lane, who is a member of my research team, just to let me know that the slides are broadcasting okay. All right, thank you. Thank you all so much for being here today and sharing this time together. It is really an honor to be invited to speak with the 82nd Comet Aviation Brigade, Pegasus Priority Program. I know our community connections give us such immense purpose and meaning perhaps more now than ever. And even though we're only seeing each other on the screen today, just knowing that amidst the uncertainty and challenges around us, that we can spend time to talk about this important issue in our community gives me a sense of hope. It also takes strong leadership, it takes courage to talk about these kinds of difficult topics, sexual harassment, sexual assault, and how they affect our communities. Importantly, today we are here to talk about how we can address and prevent these problems. So I really hope that the time we spend together today helps you consider ways to enhance and support individuals within your community, your family, your unit, and really reflect on ways that you can take this information, increase your understanding about how to prevent sexual assault and support survivors. So just to get started with this obligatory statement, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose today, but I will note that the information that I present today is the sentiment of the author or the authors and not the funding agencies that have supported the work of myself or my collaborators. And aside from being able to be sure to finish on time without any technical difficulties, I have four goals for our time together. Broadly, I'm gonna review the state of the evidence of what works in sexual assault prevention broadly and specifically with military populations and the steps that each of us can take to create a safer community. As a result of the program, I have four specific aims. I hope that you'll understand the theoretical approaches to sexual assault prevention. Not every program is the same and how you address the issue really does matter. I also hope that you understand the evidence base to support various times of sexual assault prevention approaches. You know. We have choices in the kind of programs that we deliver um, to our community, to our unit, and hopefully some of this information can help you potentially make decisions about the kind of prevention education that you might be able to provide to those around you. I also hope you understand as a result of this presentation, the role that bystanders can play in fostering community norms change. And by bystander, I'll say that word a lot today. I just mean someone who's standing by and seeing something happen. And lastly, I want you to have a little bit of information today about how to support survivors. And I also want to note that when we think about supporting survivors, just in this community gathered here today, there are survivors among us. And I want to acknowledge the survivors that are here today to be a part of this discussion. Across these objectives, I'm also going to follow a public health approach to sexual violence. And this focuses on translating theory and evidence of risk factors and also protective factors into effective prevention and intervention approaches. And first, let me explain why this public health approach really matters. Perhaps you've heard the term public health intervention, just as you've been watching some of the news coverage with COVID-19. For the field of sexual violence prevention, however, we have not always had this public health approach in our prevention lens. At times, instead, this field of sexual violence prevention has been guided by a crime control perspective. And from this lens, we have different kinds of prevention approaches. Specifically, if we take a crime control approach, and this was very common in the 1970s, it was really focused on the incapacitation, the treatment and rehabilitation of offenders or the deterrence of the crime itself. And as a result of taking this approach, some of the early interventions, even in the 1980s, really focused on biological interventions with convicted sexual offenders. Or 
primary prevention efforts um, or secondary prevention efforts with those who were deemed to be at risk to engage in violence. However, there's been a lot of criticism of this criminological approach. First, we know that there are very low conviction rates of sexual assault. So for focusing on only those who have been convicted of this crime, we're only working with a small group of offenders. And rather than following this criminological kind of approach to prevention, we really need to find ways of intervening in the conditions of our communities that continue to produce offenders. I'll share with you one other early strategy and approach for violence prevention. Gladstone in an early article in 1980 grouped these into two other kinds of approaches. First, opportunity reduction, and second, legislative prevention, right? Focusing on what kind of policies or punishments we can implement. And let me briefly explain why we've moved away from either of these approaches. As you may know, opportunity reduction focuses on making the target of an attack inaccessible or unattractive by making the attack itself dangerous or unprofitable for a criminal. And during the 1970s, anti-rape activists divide numerous strategies um, that were really designed to deflect assaults. In fact, there was one research article that found over 1,000 different strategies that were pitched as opportunity reduction strategies. However, this idea such as carrying pepper spray, not walking alone at night, not dressing in a certain manner. As many of you will guess, these kinds of reduction opportunity approaches were heavily criticized by feminist advocates of putting the onus of prevention on potential victims instead of perpetrators. These initiatives were then labeled as really stopgap measures of the, really preventing the problem of sexual violence. And as two researchers, Sparks and Barr on noted, while the use of these kinds of cautionary or security devices could save some people from immediate danger, these precautions really do nothing to reduce the threat of sexual violence. And even sometimes people who follow these, quote, rules can be assaulted. Furthermore, just knowing that you could fight back if assaulted is very different than the kind of security you have knowing that you won't be attacked at all. Goodness. Wouldn't I love to sometimes just go out for a run, not worrying about wanting to set an alert on my phone or texting someone of where I'm going to be. This is the kind of security I'm talking about. I'm talking about really moving towards envisioning communities where populations, vulnerable populations, don't worry about being attacked. Next, let me talk about legislative approaches and how we've moved away from these. Legislative approaches really focus on punishments and also have been very favorable within crime deterrence movements. And as a result of legislative and policy approaches, we do see many benefits. We see victims assistance programs. We see other programs designed to facilitate the prosecution of offenders. However, ultimately these legislative efforts, although vital, do not necessarily move us towards educating individuals on what needs to change in order to change communities towards being safer. Further, as discussed by Lieutenant General Robert L. Kaslan and colleagues at West Point, in an article that is highly recommended for those of you who are looking for some more reading, it's called Getting to the Left of Sharp. Focusing on legislation also fosters this fear of punishment among individuals. And as a result, some individuals may be unlikely to speak up when they see occurrence of harassment within their community. Instead, what is needed is not more legislation, that's really a foundation. Instead, what we need is education. So I'll pitch you this broad vision. How can we imagine our communities without sexual violence? And perhaps some, you know, some of my colleagues have criticized me for being a bit too lofty in pursuing this goal, some believe it's not possible to get to zero when it comes to sexual harassment and violence. However, when embarking on prevention signs, I do believe that our work can and must be guided by the belief that there is an opportunity to change what we see as normal. I don't believe it's acceptable to think of violence as normative or normal, or this is just how it has to be or is. This is not just what has to happen at parties or in offices, 
or the type of talk that quote, just happens in locker rooms. We need to move towards this being intolerable. And years ago, members of Mothers Against Drunk Driving had a similar cultural shift in what we considered as normative in terms of drunk driving. And depending on the age that you are on this call, maybe you remember this. Seatbelts weren't always normal to wear. Sometimes we have this idea of forgive them, they know not what they do when it comes to drunk driving. Mothers Against Drunk Driving has made significant progress in changing our cultural beliefs about drunk driving, bringing down rates of drunk driving, increasing the normality of calling a cab or taking the keys when someone's at risk. I want us to have a similar cultural shift when it comes to violence prevention. So how do we get there? The public health approach. This public health approach may be familiar to some of you who have, who have taken classes in different kinds of health intervention strategies. For those of you who are unfamiliar, I like to talk about this approach in terms of a story. It's called The Fisher and the River. The story goes a little bit like this. One day, a fish catcher was fishing from a riverbank when they saw someone being swept downstream. They were struggling to keep their head above water. And so, of course, the fisher jumped in. They grabbed the person, helped them from struggling. They got them to shore. And soon they heard another cry for help and saw someone else being swept downstream. The fisher, of course, immediately jumped into the river and saved that person as well. And this scenario continued all afternoon. For those of you who like to fish, you can imagine how distressing this would be. And as soon as the fisher returned to fishing, they would hear another cry for help and would wade in and rescue another wet and drowning person. Finally, the fisher said to themselves, I can't go on like this. I better go upstream and find out what's happening. This is the public health approach, getting to the left of the problem, moving upstream to prevent tragedy from occurring downstream. This analogy helps us consider things that we need to do, not just as individuals, but as a group to consider strategies for sexual assault prevention and also intervention. This public health approach also gets us thinking about what kind of protections we can put in place so that people do not fall into the river and also gets us to think about the benefits of working strategically as teams. And if we put this approach into practice, it looks a little bit like this. This is a diagram presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, who started applying this public health approach to sexual assault prevention in about the year 2000. This public health approach begins with a definition of the problem. We have to know what we're dealing with, what it looks like. These definitions are then used to systematically identify risk and protective factors associated with victimization and perpetration and also the types of communities, climates, environments where violence is more common. Then we use this information to strategically develop prevention approaches that target those risk and protective factors. And for the next parts of our time together, I'm gonna to really walk us through each step of this model, talking about how this can apply to sexual assault prevention for military populations. So first, let's start with definitions. And for the purpose of DOD-wide sexual assault prevention and response awareness training, we use the term sexual assault as intentional sexual contact characterized by the use of force, physical threat, or abuse of authority when the victim does not or cannot consent. This includes rape, sodomy, indecent assaults, sexual contact, fondling, or attempts to commit these acts. It's important to note that this definition recognizes that individuals can experience sexual assault regardless of age, sexual orientation, or gender identity. It can also occur in and out of many different types of relationships. It can occur between strangers, acquaintances, dating partners, and within marriage. Sexual harassment then is a form of gender discrimination that involves an unwelcome sexual advance, request for a sexual favor, or another verbal or um, physical contact of a sexual nature between or between same or opposite genders. And here, there could be an explicit or implicit term or condition relating to someone's job or pay or their career. It could be that the unwelcome sexual advance is also related to career advancement or a decision that affects that person. Or simply the sexual advance verbal comment, physical behavior, 
has an adverse effect on the working environment of that person. It creates a hostile or intimidated or offensive working environment. And when you look at some of the definitions that we see within the DOD, verbal sexual harassment includes things like telling sexual jokes or also nonverbal behaviors such as thinking. And I mentioned earlier that sexual assault can also occur within intimate relationships. And I want to spend a little bit of time walking you through some of the signs of sexual coercion. This can take many forms and often isn't something that individuals recognize as a form of sexual violence. Sexual coercion is when someone might try to threaten you or threaten to hurt someone else if you don't engage in sexual activity. So for example, if you don't want to sleep with me, that's fine. Your friend's drunk. I bet they won't say no. Threaten to end a relationship, saying something um, coercive um, or pressuring you. Like, you know, people in relationships have sex. If we aren't going to have sex, then I'm out of here. It's over. Jeopardizing your career. You know, I could really make it tough for you around here. Badgering, not taking no for an answer. Emotional manipulation, guilt trips, denying affection. And perhaps a partner says, oh, I understand. It's okay. But then they stomp off. They, they sigh um, or they slam a door. Um, accusing someone of cheating, telling someone that they should feel grateful um, that an individual wants to have sex with them because they could sleep with anyone, or social pressure. You know, we've gone on three dates, isn't it time? These are all forms of sexual pressure that make it very difficult for a person to say no. So let's get into talking a little bit more about the scope of sexual assault now that we have some of a common understanding of definitions. And I'll say that the US military is not alone in facing issues of sexual assault. It is just one institution within a larger society that shares this problem. And in fact, according to the NISPIS report, which is a large national survey of sexual violence, if we adjust for age and marital status, rates of sexual assault specifically among women in the military mirror that of the general population. However, addressing sexual assault in the military presents some unique challenges. For example, survivors in the military often continue to work in close contact with assailants, and this could magnify the negative effects of an attack. And also sexual assault within the military affects the entire unit. It jeopardizes operational readiness, unit cohesion, morale, teamwork, all things that are vital to military service. And one way to look at the rates of sexual assault within the military is to look at the reported assaults. And I'm sharing here with you the fiscal year 19 um, fiscal reports of statistical data from the Department of Defense annual report of sexual assault in the military. These only re record reported sexual assaults. And you see here that there are over 7,000 reports of sexual assault involving service members as either victims or subjects. And as many of you may know, victims make a restricted report to specific individuals. And these reports are not referred for investigation, do not involve review by command. Or individuals can make an unrestricted report of sexual assault. This is referred for investigation and command is notified of the alleged incident. DOD collects data on unrestricted reports um, from the cases that are entered into the database. Notably, these rates of sexual assault that are reported in a given year do not necessarily indicate the number of sexual assaults that may have occurred in that year. This difference exists because we know that a smaller number of assaults are reported than actually occur. We can also look at rates of sexual assault within the military by trying to examine how many people do reach out for help, not reporting, but for example, reaching out to a helpline. The DOD Safe Helpline support Supports SAPR programs for providing crisis intervention, support, resources for members of the community who have experienced sexual assault. And you can call this hotline if you've experienced harm, or you can call the hotline to get information for someone else. The service is confidential, it's anonymous, it's secure, it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Its availability ensures that all victims have a place to safely disclose sexual assault allegations, get information, talk to someone, express their concerns. In fiscal year 19, we see that over 36,000 users contacted the Safe Helpline for assistance. This was on the phone or online. Of these individuals, 87% indicated that they had personally experienced a sexual assault, and some other individuals called on behalf of other individuals. 
to try to get them help or prevent re-victimization. Greater than a third of the phone users in fiscal year 2019 were also men. And it's also important to have a sense of what kind of assaults are occurring. As I mentioned, a third of the callers to the hotline were men. And oftentimes we don't recognize men's experiences, uh, men's experiences of sexual victimization. Oftentimes when we think about stereotypical assaults, this has been framed as, quote, a women's issue or men perpetrating violence against women. And if we look at the data, we realize the importance of needing to bust that myth. If we look at the Workplace and Gender Relations Survey, this gives us really great information about the types of assaults that are happening within the community. And I'm sharing with you here the 2019 Workplace and Gender Relations Survey of Reserve Component Members. We see that for women and men who are reporting on this survey, the worst situation of sexual assault, sexual assault involved one alleged offender, but a small proportion of assaults, about a third, involved more than one offender. For women, most situations did involve an offender who were male, a member of the military, and also higher ranking. And also just looking at the women, about 22% noted that the offender was a member of their chain of command. And for about two, um, two thirds of women, the alleged offender was someone other than a higher ranking military member in their unit. These only refer to the one situation of sexual assault during the past 12 months that individuals perceive to be the worst assault. And we had about 35,000 surveys in this, representative from Army National Guard, Navy Reserve, Marine Corps Reserve, Air Force Reserve, and Air National Guard. And if you're looking for another great resource for really trying to understand the scope of this issue, and I will post each of these resources for folks to be able to access after the talk, this is the 2019 Military Service Gender Relations Focus Group Report. You know, data, numerical data, give us one side of this issue, but we really need to hear from people and their stories. And this focus group report will give you some of the stories of individuals. One of the quotes that I think is really important in this focus group report is to shift our lens from sexual assault into sexual harassment, which is often more commonly occurring than assault. In the report, it notes that in general, participants indicated that sexual harassment at their installation included lower level behaviors like staring, gawking, making sexual jokes or comments, sharing explicit images or repeated attempts at unwanted relationships. So in this conversation, it's important that we keep the scope of sexual harassment in mind as well. We know that sexual assault is associated with numerous short-term and long-term mental health and physical consequences. For example, depression, PTSD, health complaints, complications in sexual functioning, decreased work capacity, problem drinking, suicide attempts, and also military attrition and demotion. And in this last study, among women veterans, sexual trauma victims demonstrated greater psychological impairment compared to those reporting other types of trauma. The interpersonal, the intimate nature of sexual trauma and the way that it dismantles our trust in others and sometimes our sense of self makes this experience extremely complex and nuanced in the path of recovery. And I also say that the stigma surrounding sexual assault can be even more complex for men who experience assault and are grappling with the notion um, that this doesn't happen to men when we know it does. And I'll also note, as we're going through this data, as I mentioned before, that most, most assaults are underreported. And it's important to note that within civilian military settings, when we look at some of the rates of sexual assault that are reported, we are undomestic, underestimating the prevalence of sexual violence. We see that individuals are unlikely to report if the perpetrator is within their chain of command, and also there are just a lot of feared consequences of reporting, perceived or actual, being worried about being ostracized, shunning, shaming, harsh treatment, damage to your career. And we can look at the 2019 Workplace and Gender Relations Survey of reserve component members. We see that about 73% of women who experienced sexual assault did not report to any legal authority. Their top reasons for not reporting were this. They wanted to forget about it and move on, didn't want people to know, 
felt ashamed or embarrassed, thought it would make their work situation unpleasant, and not thinking that anything would be done. In fact, in my clinical work, oftentimes I'm working with individuals that much later in life are starting to grapple with experiences of, sex of sexual victimization that happened to them when they were youth, adolescence, or in adulthood. So what do we do? If we know that reports of sexual violence uh, coming to the authorities are low, how do we know the prevalence of assault if so few people report? I'll share with you one survey of sexual violence, and there are many different surveys that we can do to try to capture the incidence of sexual violence without relying on reports to an authority. This is the Sexual Experience Survey. It um, was developed by Mary Coffs in the 1980s and was since revised and um, is going to be revised again shortly. This is a survey that uses behaviorally specific and also sexually explicit definitions of instances that would be legally defined as sexual assault, that individuals can respond yes or no to, even if they wouldn't identify it as a sexual assault survivor themselves. So for example, have you had sexual intercourse when you didn't want to because someone threatened or used some degree of physical force to make you? Um, this survey has good reliability and validity. And when I'm doing um, research of sexual violence within military populations, these are the kinds of surveys that we're using. And in fact, when we look back 30 years ago, this was the measure that Mary Koss utilized in her study in the 1980s that was published in Ms. Magazine. Um, she used this survey measure 30 years ago to look at what she called hidden rape on college campuses. She studied about 7,000 women and men at 32 different institutions of higher education and found that the rates of sexual assault in the population were staggering about 54% of women reported some form of unwanted sexual contact, ranging from sexual contact to rape from the age of 14 to the time of the study. And these were college freshmen kind of in their psychology 101, 101 classes completing a survey. She also gave the survey to men. She found that about 25% of college men reported perpetrating some form of unwanted sexual contact against someone when they knew the individual did not want to participate. 25%. Importantly, with this survey, we're not asking people, were you assaulted, were you raped? We know that the majority of people, when they're asked that question, oftentimes don't label what they experienced as sexual victimization or assault. Oftentimes we have stereotypes of what that looks like, or it just emotionally, um, it, it's a difficult thing to say I was assaulted. So for those reasons, sometimes people may not put the label on the experience. We've done a couple replications of the cost study, and these are civilian data coming out of Ohio universities from two studies that we did. We see 20 years later of this, following this cost study, the rates are still very similar among college students. We see about 40% of college women reporting some form of sexual victimization from the time of 14 to the time of the study, and also about 17% of college men reporting perpetrating some form of sexual violence. And I share these data with you to note that when we think about individuals who are entering military service, we know that many individuals are experiencing some form of sexual violence before they enter the force. We can look at other surveys. These are data from the Center for, for Disease Control and Prevention. This is the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. For parents who are on the call here, this is a survey that's done in schools, in high schools. Many high schools do this survey and you can look up the data for your state. We see in this nationwide survey, 7% of high school students report being forced to have sex. About one in 10 female and one in 32 male students report experienced forced sex in their lifetime. So this problem is not just among individuals within military populations. This is also a problem within colleges, within our youth and adolescents. And I want you to remember that as we go through our talk, because I want to leave you with the recognition that preventing sexual assault is something we need to do across this lifespan. This is something that needs to start young in middle school and high school before individuals enter military service. We've also done some work looking at what's the prevalence of different kinds of assaults. Are the majority of assaults happening during military service, before or after? These are data that I published with a colleague, Susanna Creech, who is working out of the VA in Texas. And we looked at about 350 women uh, who presented for primary care at the VA. 
we found that over 60% reported some prior history of forced sexual intercourse. And you can see at the bottom of this slide that oftentimes individuals were experiencing more than one experience of forced sexual intercourse, and it was very split. For some individuals, it was only before the age of 17. For some individuals, it was pre-military, but as an adult. For others, it was while on active duty, and for others, it was active after military service. And we know that individuals are more likely to experience victimization during military service if they enter military service already having a history of victimization. So let's go back to this public health approach. Now that we know the scope of the problem, I do wanna give you a sense of where some of the research is at and understanding some of the risk and protective factors. Because as I mentioned, this is how we use data to drive prevention really focusing on what puts individuals at risk, how can we ameliorate those factors, and then also understanding what helps people to be resilient or protected from this and hoping to bolster those within our community. This model is called the ecological model. It recognizes that risk factors for sexual violence are not just within people, they're within relationships, communities, and within society, society at large. If we look at individual level influences and the kinds of things we wanna target in individuals, we see factors like personal alcohol use, attitudes or beliefs that support sexual violence, impulsive or other antisocial characteristics being associated with proclivity for sexual violence. At an interpersonal level, your close social circle, your peers, your partners, your family members, they shape what you believe is acceptable. And we see that individuals who believe that their peers support sexual violence, or believe that their peers would think it's okay to give someone alcohol in order for it to be easier to have sex with them, those peer relationships are associated with increased risk for sexual violence. We also see community level influences. So for example, general tolerance of sexual assault, if leadership doesn't take a strong stance, we see higher rates of sexual violence within those communities. And then also broadly factors at the societal level thinking about inequalities based on gender, race, and sexual orientation. And if we try to boil down into the research, looking at individuals who perpetrate sexual aggression, we do see that this is a very heterogeneous group. There is no one profile of an individual who engages in sexual aggression. Some individuals perpetrate more than once, but not all do. Some individuals perpetrate when using alcohol, some perpetrate when sober or when using alcohol, and some perpetrate only when using alcohol. There's no one pattern. And the bulk of this research comes from what we call undetected sexual aggressors, meaning individuals that have not come to the attention of the criminal justice system, which would be research on sexual offenders who are incarcerated. Instead, these are research studies where you've given the sexual experiences survey to identify someone who's perpetrated. And then you give other kinds of measures of attitudes and behaviors to see among those group, the group of individuals who have reported perpetrating an assault, you know, what, what are they characterized by? And in this group, different from convicted sexual offenders, individuals who engage in sexual aggression, who don't come to the attention of the legal system are often individuals who are assaulting acquaintances, and using strategies such as alcohol, either deliberately getting someone intoxicated or looking opportunistically for someone who is intoxicated in order to take advantage of them, using these kinds of strategies or using coercion instead of force in order to perpetrate. These individuals tend to share the following factors. They tend to view relationships with women as adversarial. Um, they tend to put down women, um, have very traditional views perhaps of gender roles, they participate in peer networks that support objectification and mistreatment of women, perceive that their behavior is supported by their peers, have a sense of entitlement, seeing sex as a sign of social status, have earlier and more frequent sexual experiences, see sexual activity as a game, kind of this idea as of the notch on the bedpost, if you will, and tend to perpetrate more than once. And I'll share with you a quote from one of my research studies. Um, these were data that um, we've recently published in Journal of Interpersonal Violence, looking, um, just talking with college men about um, how they view dating situations. And our interviewer asked, you know, what's it like for most guys in the dating scene? And this participant really spelled out 
this idea of sexual activity as social status. The participant noted, as far as guys go, I wouldn't call it a game. It's kind of like the typical, oh, I'm gonna go to a party. Let's see how many girls I could take home. Or last week, if you took a girl home, let's see if you can do it again this week with a different girl or something like that. And the interviewer says, it's almost like a challenge or a game. Yeah. Participant says, it, it's kind of a challenge to see who can be that guy. And we know that this culture of pressure on men to have a high number of sexual partners is one of the factors that is associated with perpetrating sexual assault. If you feel like this is something you have to do or all of your buddies are doing, you may resort to something like targeting someone who's had too much to drink because you believe that they would be an easier sexual partner. Here's another uplifting quote for you. What do you think could be done to prevent sexual assault? I asked this of one of um, our early research participants um, at a college. They said, honestly, I don't know what you can do. <laughs> they can drill it into your head every week, have a meeting with someone and tell them that what sexual assault is and not to do it if the girl's too drunk. But when you are actually drunk, you're not thinking of the sexual assault prevention video you just saw. You're just thinking about that moment. And I show this to you not so we're even more disheartened when talking about this subject, but because I think it talks about how much more we need to do when we design our prevention initiatives than simply having a meeting. We need to think strategically. We need to think synergistically. We need to use all of the tools, a strategy that we know work to pe keep people safe. And we need to apply them to this public health issue as well. So let's move into it. Let's move into developing and testing prevention strategies and follow this public health approach. I'll spend the rest of my time together really focuses on strategies that can address this problem. And when I think about prevention approaches, I think about the ways we can use simultaneous approaches to really achieve population level impact. So working with individuals, working within peer groups, working within the community and at the policy level. And if we think about this logically, I think we can all agree that information alone is not going to be a magic wand. A PowerPoint, one motivational speaker, inspiration alone, is unlikely to foster skill development among participants. Think about how you train people in something. It's not just enough to tell them how to do something. They've got to practice. They need to talk about it. You need to watch them, coach them in having difficult conversations. So simply knowing the definition of consent, simply knowing what sexual assault is and not to do it is just not enough. As preventionists, we know that behavior change requires application and practice in skills. And I speak to this a little bit in an article we published recently with some of my colleagues who are also preventionists. We need to be more strategic in our approach, really look under the surface of this issue to try to dismantle some of the systems within our community that are making violence occur. Oftentimes our programs are too much of a single shot intervention, a workshop or a PowerPoint. And given the depth of this problem with our communities, it's just not sufficient dosage to result in a change. And the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has been pushing towards this synergistic approach. This is a slide from the Stop SB package. So for those of you who are looking for another great resource on what types of prevention approaches, this is a phenomenal one. The Stop SB package features five strategies, promoting social norms that protect against violence, teaching skills to prevent sexual violence, providing opportunities to empower and support girls and women. And this starts very young. Creating protective environments and also supporting victims and survivors to lessen harms. So let me talk about this first part of social norms. What is a social norm? I think we've been hearing that idea of social norms, things not being normative. It's not the way we do things. I think we've been hearing that a lot in the news lately. And simply put, a social norm is a value, it's a custom, a belief. It, it dictates what we believe to be normal for a group. So think about the social norm of riding an elevator. When you go in an elevator, you go in, and unless it's one of those elevators with two sides, right, <laughs> where you don't know which is the front and the back, you go into an elevator and you turn around to face the door. That's normative. It's what people do. Probably no one taught you how to ride an elevator. 
Um, you know, maybe for the parents on the call, you've looked at your little one and kind of turned them toward the front when they're facing the back of the elevator <laughs> because you recognize that wasn't quite how we do it. Uh, but usually we just watch the people around us and we kind of learned how to ride an elevator. That's the norm. And for a norm to be real, it's not necessary for the majority of people to believe it, but just for people to perceive that that's what others do. And this idea of social norms, it applies to our elevator use, but it applies to sexual violence as well. It applies to a lot of behaviors. It applies to smoking, alcohol use, you know, where we think it's okay to talk on our cell phone. Um, so these are unspoken rules of what's normal. And the good news when it comes to sexual violence is that most people believe it's very important to have sexual consent before sexual activity. Most people would not use coercion, alcohol, or force to obtain sex. Most people disapprove of others who speak of you know, others in a derogatory way. And also most people are uncomfortable by stereotypes when it comes to masculinity and femininity. And these are all positives. But importantly, when we look at the social norms approach to prevention, we see that most people do not recognize how much people engage in positive behavior. And they also don't recognize that the majority of people don't engage in problem behavior. And as a result, if we don't recognize that most people would speak out against injustice, and most people, it's not normative not to have consent before sexual activity, then that can fuel that behavior among individuals. Perpetrators could believe that it's normal to get away with the behavior, or individuals may not speak up because they believe that other people wouldn't want them to. Let me show you some of this data on a study that we did um, very recently looking at per perceived and collective norms associated with sexual violence among soldiers. This was a CDMRP funded study through the Department of Defense that we published recently in the Journal of Family Violence. Simply, we asked soldiers, these were young male soldiers between the ages of 18 and 24, do you personally agree that you would stop the first time your partner says no to sexual activity? Or personally, would you stop sexual activity when you were asked, even if you were sexually aroused? Over 90% of people said yes, and that is a positive thing. Most people would not continue sexual activity if their partner says no. It's also important to note that 7% of people in these cases said they wouldn't, and that's alarming. However, here's the important thing for social norms. If we look at the percent of people who thought that other soldiers would do that, it's quite much lower. So we asked what percent of other soldiers would stop the first time their partner said no, or what percent of other soldiers would stop sexual activity when asked to. And you see that it's only rated at about 64%, which suggests that soldiers do not recognize how positive the climate is. They don't recognize how many other soldiers do have a positive belief that they wouldn't engage in these kinds of problem behaviors. We look at other ongoing research at Fort Bragg. These are unpublished data. We're working on the publication now, but we see the same thing when it comes to intervening. Bystander intervention. 91% of individuals would ask if everything's okay if they witnessed a fellow male soldier pressuring a woman to leave with them. Whereas only they perceived that only 60% of their peers would do that. Similarly, 96% of soldiers would do something if they saw a fellow soldier out and, you know, if someone put something in a woman's drink. But they believe that only about 78% of other soldiers would say something to get involved to stop it. And similarly, 93% of individuals would respect another soldier who steps in to intervene if it looks like a man is trying to hook up with a woman who's had too much to drink but they thought that only 65% of other soldiers would respect someone. So here again, we see this gap between the actual norm and what soldiers think. And this reminds me of the importance of sharing the good news, that this is something that most people within our community care about. We care about creating a safe culture. And if most people know that their peers want to do the right thing, they want to step out, they would get involved if they saw something troubling happening, we're more likely to step up and do something about it when we see it happening as well, because we know people would have our back. And this is this bystander approach to prevention. It's standing up or speaking out against a sexist joke. It's not laughing when someone says something around the dinner table that's actually offensive. You know, it's creating a culture 
where we all stand up against injustice. And it starts by noticing a problem, labeling it as a problem, believing that this is my community, so it's my responsibility to say something, even if it means feeling like maybe I'm sticking my nose where it doesn't belong, and taking action in a way that is safe for me to do so. And this is how bystander intervention creates a positive culture. I think of our culture as like a soil, plants grow in the soil. And for those of you who are gardeners, you know that the composition of soil really determines what can grow well. And a culture, unfortunately, can let things grow and fester in a way that is harmful for others if we don't create the right foundation, we don't create the right culture. We're all a part of our community. We all can play a role in bystander intervention. And bystander intervention really shifts our perspective from a criminological or legislative perspective or opportunity reduction perspective for calling us all to the table for sexual assault prevention. This is not just about asking individuals to do something to make them less likely to experience violence. This is about each of us and what we can do to create a safer community. And I'll have you put some answers in the chat if you feel comfortable here. I want you to think about a time, and you don't have to tell the time, but I want you to think about a time where you saw something that made you feel uncomfortable and where you didn't say or do something about it. And I want you to think about how you felt, how you felt in that moment, how you felt afterwards, and think about what kept you from making the decision to do something. I want to hear about those barriers. I want to hear about why you didn't intervene. Maybe you didn't know what to do. Maybe you wondered if speaking up, you know, you get in trouble. <laughs> not my place, not my role, not my rank. Um, maybe you were just sick of intervening. You felt like you'd said it. How many other family dinners? How many other times have you spoken up about this and nothing changes? You know, what keeps you from doing something to make a difference? Maybe you wanted to, but you didn't know how. You know, as we think about these things that come up in the text box, I really want folks to know that you are not alone in these barriers. It is difficult to do things, to intervene. Sometimes, you know, we need to know that other people would support us. Sometimes we need to know that it's okay to feel embarrassed. You know, even if I did feel a little bit embarrassed telling that person that they were talking a little too loud on their cell phone in the airport. You know, I bet there were 10 other people sitting right around me who were very happy not to hear their conversation anymore. You know, it's really sometimes about going out on the limb and overcoming those barriers. And I wanna share with you some things that you can do. What can you do as a bystander? This is a chart prepared by Alan Berkowitz. He's a subject matter expert to the military to address issues of sexual violence. He gives you a couple different strategies. Sometimes in the moment you go directly to the offender, directly to the source, either during or after the incident. You can shift attitudes using an open conversation, saying something like, I, I, I wonder why, you know, I wonder why you might say that, or what did you mean by that? I'm really curious. The goal here isn't to wag your finger at the person and tell them that they were wrong, but really try to understand what they were thinking when they said it. It helps a person to understand why their behavior is problematic and helps to foster deeper change, kind of shifts their attitude. Or sometimes you go to the person after the incident, after you've had some time to talk with other people, take care of yourself, blow off some steam. You know, sometimes I'm not in the right mindset to intervene. I need to, you know, bring my emotions down a little bit so I can talk with someone with the right tone of voice. Or sometimes you do intervention indirectly. You talk to some friends or colleagues about intervening as a group. You get someone else to intervene. You develop support or engage someone else who might be better equipped to say something or do, some, do something to intervene after the situation. And what I want to emphasize here is there is no one right way to intervene. You may not always be in the right position to help, but we can take into account different strategies. It's about having a number of different options that feel safe in that moment or afterwards. And I also wanna acknowledge that there's power dynamics here. You know, there's, we think about the intersections of our identity race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, age. 
Um, we can't really say that we should have done X or Y or Z in this situation. There are simply too many variables and too many things that are at play, um, whether our, it be relating to the power that we have in that situation or our safety to act that can influence what we say or do. But regardless of the situation, our goal is really to find ways to do something directly or indirectly during or after the event to try to direct, distract, or delegate the situation to make a difference. So here are some examples. Let's say we see individuals who appear to be in a risky, risky sexual situation. You can get in the middle, separate them, let them know your reasons for intervening, be a friend, let them know that you're acting on their best interest. Let's say you see someone trying to take someone home from a bar who seems to be too intoxicated to consent. You can simply go up and if it feels right, like the right time or place, um, intervene directly. You can distract people involved, or just redirecting their focus elsewhere. Um, saying something like, hey, I'm getting out of here. Why don't you come with me? Or hey, you know, this place is lame. Let's head somewhere else. Trying to get someone out of a difficult situation. Or you can get support, examine the situation, see what other people would do, recruit friends, recruit colleagues, see what other people would do and, and help as a group. I'm saying, you know, it looks like someone else is in a bad spot. Uh, do you mind going over there with me and checking out the situation and see, see what's going on? I don't wanna go over alone. Or you explore the situation. If you don't know exactly what's going on, try to find out, join the conversation, gauge the reaction of both people. Could you get a friend to help out in the situation? Talk to other people involved. Or you call for help. Let's say there's a situation that looks like it's escalating, it's getting vibrant. Um, and maybe someone's already left with a potential victim. Get information about a car, a license plate, a description of two people. Um, call for help. And of course, these are situations where I'm talking more about an imminent sexual assault. These are infrequently occurring, less probable situations. The more frequent time that we're called for bystander intervention is more in relation to sexual harassment. When we hear someone saying a sexist comment, making an objectified comment, sharing an inappropriate video. These things are more frequently occurring and oftentimes what people are just brushing aside. But as a bystander, we can have an immense, immense difference in these kinds of situations to promote a culture change. And in fact, the most recent Department of Defense Sexual Assault Prevention Strategy document notes the importance of recognizing the connection between preventing sexual assault in a continuum of harm, looking at sexist jokes, bullying, sexual harassment, hazing, drinking, stalking. Theoretically, these interventions at the lower end of the continuum of harm prevent more serious forms of harm, especially if individuals who are perpetrating are held accountable for committing the less severe acts of harm. And I'll leave you with one more thing before I share with you some strategies for violence prevention. In interviews with service members, we're talking with young male service members about bystander intervention. They tell us they go in with force. No surprise there, right? But as a prevention scientist, I wanna make sure when people go in with force that they are safe. It is essential that when you're intervening as a bystander, you do something that does not jeopardize your career or your safety or the safety of someone else. So it's important that when we're teaching bystander intervention, we offer individual strategies that may be different from the stereotypical strategy of addressing a situation full on. We may need to teach different types of emotional connection and interpersonal communication strategies that are more subtle, more nuanced forms of communication that don't put someone in a situation where escalation of aggression happens. So I'll share with you some strategies that are working in this idea of changing social norms and bystander intervention. This was a study we published back in 2011, um, so 10 years ago now, where we combine a social norms approach with bystander intervention. In this study, which we conducted at Ohio University and then revised and adapted and ran at the University of Rhode Island back in 2015, we found that over a four month period, men who participated in this program reported lower rates of re engaging in sexual aggression in comparison to a control group. 
These findings were really important because they were one of the first studies to show that participation in an intervention is directly associated with reduced rates of assault. If we look at the types of studies that have been conducted within military populations, um, the available evidence for what works for service members is limited but growing. This is one article that we published recently that did a comprehensive systematic review of the evidence base for military sexual assault prevention. In this research review, we looked at over 32,000 different results. We culled through about 6,000 different articles and we looked at about 300 articles that met our eligibility criteria. Only six research studies were documented that evaluated a sexual assault prevention program using a rigorous scientific methodology for military populations. These six studies had five different sexual assault prevention approaches. So if you were looking for evidence-based approaches, this is what we know in the research literature. Bringing in the bystander has been evaluated. This is a workshop approach. Know Your Power, it's a social marketing campaign. And the Men's Program, which is a workshop approach specifically for men. And then we also have the Navy Sexual Assault Intervention Training Program and also the Sexual Assault Victim Intervention. Each of these interventions has been looked at in different kind of evaluations designs. I'm gonna move through these pretty quickly so that we can get to some more discussion. But I'll share with you that bringing in the bystander has been adapted specifically for the Army and it's about a four and a half hour program. The program impact of rate on rates of sexual assault was not examined, but there were some other positive impacts in terms of intentions to intervene. Know Your Power, as I mentioned, is a social marketing campaign. So these are a series of posters that were plastered through the barracks, um, even giving laundry bags to individuals with positive prevention messages. And individuals um, who were exposed to the campaign did say that they were more likely to act as a result. The men's program is a one hour prevention workshop that should increase self-efficacy and willingness to intervene to prevent rape. And the Navy Sexual Assault Intervention Training Program, um, when it was examined across an 18 month period, there were 74 sessions of the program conducted and individuals did show increased knowledge about rape and also increased empathy for victims. And finally, the SAVVY program. Um, the surveys were distributed to about 27 of the SAVVY programs and data were not presented on how this program shifts attitudes and behaviors, but the program does increase individuals' level of concern regarding this issue. So what do we know? If there's only six evaluations, we know there's a way to go in improving the state of the science. As I'll share with you shortly, there are numerous studies now underway. The Department of Defense has invested considerable resources in really expanding the science and practice of sexual assault prevention. Currently, we do lack evaluation on program effectiveness of some of the programs that are being implemented, but I do hope that within the next five to 10 years, that there will be a significant advancement. So as you think about this, what can we do? What can we do to improve the evidence of what works to prevent sexual harassment and assault? And I would love to see some of those comments in the, in the comment box for folks. You know, what do we need to do? Who do we need to be talking to? Do we need more leadership involvement? Do we need more involvement of junior leaders? Do we need less PowerPoint and more discussion? All of these ideas, when we start really thinking about what we want to see to improve our communities, this starts to kind of turn the cranks to get us all invested in improving our prevention climate. And I'll share with you some of my ideas. My recommendation, first, I think we need to be comprehensive. We need to develop a vision of that big picture. As I mentioned, we want to think about getting to zero, and it is not going to be through single shot programs. We have to be synergistic. We have to permeate all aspects of our system and target the community as a whole. We need to be intensive and have synergy. We need to link our activities. We need to sustain them over time and think about adequate dose and intensity. For example, different individuals at various levels may need different skills. It may not be that viewing the same set of slides really helps people acquire a knowledge base. We need to think about how we can build on things successively. We need to tailor our programs. We need them to be relevant 
instead of repetitive. Take out what individuals already know and build on their skill sets. We need to be data-driven. We need to understand norms and also understand how our current initiatives are working and use that data continually to revise and enhance them. And finally, we need positive messages. As I mentioned, the majority of individuals in our communities believe that sexual assault is something that should not be tolerated. And we need, we need to have a megaphone on that. People need to know that other people support them in intervening. We need to talk to people about what they can do, not just what they shouldn't do. And we need to acknowledge this problem in, in a climate that acknowledges the positive norms and focus on well-being. And finally, we've got to get individuals practicing. We have to move towards from just thinking about what knowledge people need into thinking about what kind of conversations they need to practice. We need to be talking to leaders about how to have difficult conversations within their unit and allow people to reflect and discuss difficult issues. And as I mentioned, we have a couple of really exciting different projects that are moving in, the, in this direction. Um, the At Fort Bragg through Womack Army Medical Center led by Dr. Chris Barry Caban, there was a recently initiated Department of Defense study funded by CDMRP that is entitled Preventing Sexual Violence Through Targeting Hazing Behavior. This just launched this fall um, and will be running for the next three years to try to develop a hazing prevention framework. As I mentioned, especially among men, sexual victimization in military populations often occurs in the context of hazing. And I'm really excited for this study um, because I think we can do some really great work to move the needle on this issue. Um, this is something that is happening um, at Fort Bragg at Womack Army Medical Center. If you're interested in getting involved in the military advisory board for this, please be in touch after the presentation. This is something that we want everyone to have a voice on and we need your input. Also, we've recently initiated a personal web-based sexual assault prevention for service members. This is a grant that I'm involved in also with Amanda Gilmore and Kristen Walter. Um, we're conducting this out of Naval Health Research Center in San Francisco. This is a web-based prevention initiative, noting that sexual assault prevention in groups, it's hard to administer. We need some online solutions that can be easily deployed and implemented. So this study is also just launching and we are recruiting a military advisory board. So if you're interested in online approaches, please get in touch with me about this as well. Uh, we just started this study and we'll be running for the next three years. And ongoing research, sexual assault prevention for men in the military. This is a study that is a treatment development study that is running currently at Fort Bragg. Um, this is running um, specifically through Womack Army Medical Center under the leadership of Dr. Chris Barry Caban. This is a treatment development study where we're using a number of different things. Over the past several years, we've been using interviews, focus groups, a survey, and an open trial to develop a program that was originally developed among college students and tailor it for military populations. Because we know that just because something works in one population does not mean that the seat fits for our soldiers. Right now, we're in stage 1B of this. We are doing a larger trial of the program. Uh, the good news, if you're looking for a way to get involved, is that we are actively recruiting participants for this initiative. So I have um, I put the study ad here. Maybe you've seen it um, up and running around Womack Army Medical Center. This is something that um, soldiers between the ages of 18 and 24 are eligible for. You can scan the QR code and have a link to the survey, um, a survey screener. If you enter the survey screener and you're eligible for the study, the study staff will get in contact with you um, with information about how to get involved and participate. Um, this is something that would be running um, over the next couple months and a really great opportunity to share the good news and get individuals more active in prevention. And I'll also share with you one other study, which we just wrapped up that is just hitting the press now. This was a study that I was involved in with Dr. Karen Zlotnick. Um, we initially launched this study at the Providence VA, but then moved it to the Texas VA. And this is an intervention that is designed to support survivors. Um, we published this open trial of the SHE intervention. It is a computerized intervention for women specifically that have experienced sexual victimization while in the military. And this intervention really empowers people to think about how the experience is intersecting with health concerns. And we found in this study that the intervention reduced drinking, 
intimate partner violence, and PTSD at four, month, four months post-intervention. So there is exciting stuff going on. Um, in the next five years, as more studies start to come out, there were over five different studies that were recently funded by the DOD, um, and also a contract um, which NORC is working on, doing several different program evaluations. As these studies move forward, we are going to greatly grow our evidence base. So I wanna save some time for discussion. So I'll end with this. Not only what can we do to prevent sexual assault, but what can we do to protect survivors, help them heal, help them foster resilience. The fourth and fifth strategy of the STOP SV framework that the CDC puts forward is creating a protective environment and providing services and treatments to support victims and lessens harm. And I really hope I can emphasize that it's important to be a part of the solution of the problem of sexual violence by supporting survivors. Because upwards of 75% of survivors, when they tell someone about their experience, receive a response that leaves them feeling hurt, angry, or responsible. And most people do tell someone that they're a survivor of sexual assault, even if they don't report to an authority. So what can you say? You can believe them. You can let them know that it wasn't their fault. These kinds of positive reactions are vital. These reactions really do matter. And they can also influence a survivor's health. Negative social reactions can worsen anxiety, exacerbate trauma. So as you're thinking about how to respond to disclosure, think about the ways that you can let someone know that you see them, you hear them, you believe them, and that you'll be there to support them through their experience. So we have a little bit more time, and with that, I want to move us out um, just towards a larger discussion. So I am going to stop my screen share because I know there were a lot of really great questions that came up um, that came up in the in the um, in the questions before the presentation. We did. We and we had some that came up in the presentation as well some really good observations, some questions. Mm. Um, definitely wanna speak some of these into the room. Um, some of them replying to what do they think that um, the reason would be for standing back rather than intervening. Uh, some of the responses were that, not sure if it was, I, I wrote, I wasn't sure if it was the only one offended by the joke. And sometimes mm. you hear that so-called joke and you kind of look around and gauge everybody else's reaction and it's like well they're laughing am I the only one that thought it was rude but other people also said it's difficult when it's a family member oh yeah you know, like you talked about sitting around the dinner table and you know maybe at Thanksgiving or dinner and you have that one cousin that's constantly doing that you know and do you make that big deal about it and what we're finding out is yeah you do yeah. because if we want to prevent, we have to prevent in all aspects of our lives, Definitely. our work environment, our home environment, and our community environment. Um, another one said that whenever there was inappropriate music was a big issue at her old unit and having to listen to that, but she did go to her chief um, of the shop to help out. So she did take proactive measures. So that's great to hear. Um, more discussion would be helpful. Uh, teach and talk about it and include the spouses and families more. Mm. So I think that's a lot of what you're talking about here now is it's a community thing. We are changing the community norm. Um, we definitely wanna see this in our work environments in our military communities, but we have to start by doing it at home, doing it within our little groups of paratroopers and making that squad protected. Um, from one another if necessary, but definitely from others. And that's a place of sanctuary and shelter. And then it grows beyond. Um, somebody said that discussion, um, Krista said, discussion at a younger age, so kids grow up more aware. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, social marketing posters on the beer refrigerator doors at the shop vets. Um, if we're acknowledging that alcohol is sometimes a factor in this, what a brilliant idea, right? Um, fostering an environment where victims would feel safe coming forward with their experience instead of fearing retributions for their actions. 
And that is something that we hear a lot about in the military community, mm-hmm. that fear of the retributions or that fear of, well, he's a good guy. He wouldn't do that. He didn't mean it the way you think he meant it because he's a good guy. Um, so uh, let's sit with that for a minute. What is your observation on that about the fear of retaliation or retribution mm-hmm. or not being believed because the alleged perpetrator is considered a good guy or a good person or a good soldier? Um, what do you say to that? Oh, yeah, that's something I've certainly heard before. Um, you know, in one of my one of my roles um, within a university context has been serving as a deputy Title IX coordinator. And sometimes that means meeting with faculty members who have had complaints of sexual harassment or assault levied against them. And let me tell you, the people I meet with, these are physicians, faculty members, who certainly perceive themselves as good people too, right? And we, we want to have this kind of black and white, good guy, bad guy, good girl, but you know, it's, we want to be black and white about the issue. And, um, but I think it's much more complex um, that there may, someone may have a positive reputation. They may be a great athlete. They may be a great physician. They may be a great professor or a great researcher in some regards, but they can still engage in behaviors that harm others. Um, and I think too, towards individuals who say, well, I'm a good person. I didn't, I didn't mean to hurt anyone. Um, I hear that as well when I'm talking to individuals who have engaged in something that's inappropriate. And I'm giving them that feedback of, of, of how their actions have affected someone. And I, I think from that and that angle of the conversation, what I encourage people to do is recognize that sometimes our intention isn't to harm um, through a joke or a a comment. We didn't intend to hurt anyone, but the impact was still harmful. And and I I think when when we recognize that, it reminds us then to be more intentional. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm expecting, you know, leaders never to have fun or never make a lighthearted comment, but I'm I'm asking you to be intentional. And you know, keep the lightheartedness to subjects, topics, uh, comments that could not have an impact of harm. Um, so right. it kind of it brings us full circle um, right. in that way. And especially when we're talking about somebody reporting an incident of assault. You know, when we're talking about sexual assault, um, sometimes it's hard for the maybe the the commander who's hearing this. Um, about somebody in the formation that they believe is mm. a great soldier and, you know, just has, has served very well and done their job very well. So I think that that goes back to what you said about the onus is on us to first believe, you know, and there's a process beyond us for investigation, mm-hmm. but it's not our duty to investigate. It is our duty when somebody comes to us and says, I've been sexually assaulted by this person to not start in that defensive mode because that's not our place um, as community members and leaders. I mean, that is what UCMJ is for. That is what the criminal justice system is for. So that's a very good point to make. Um, I would like to take a moment real quick and see if um, there is our SARC, our, Master Sergeant, brand new Master Sergeant, who's just promoted this week, Master Sergeant Stewart from the 82nd Combat Aviation Brigade and the 82nd Airborne Division. Um, Are you with us today? I know you were trying to, but you had an appointment later. Master Sergeant Stewart, are you with us? Ma'am, he just got behind behind closed doors. Oh, did he? Okay. So I was hoping, thank you. Is this Val? Yes. I, okay. I was hoping that um, Master Sergeant Stewart could talk to us about what a SARC is, a sexual assault response coordinator, um, which is something that we do have in place in our military community and our work environments to respond to just that, those allegations of the sexual misconduct. Um, but 
Miss Val Mason, who just spoke up, is our victim's advocate for the 82nd Combat Aviation Brigade. So Val, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. And wondered if you might have any questions that you could lead off our question and answer time with. Um, I do not. I can answer as far as Master Sergeant Stewart's role as a SARC. Um, he can be dual-hatted. He can be a, a victim advocate on a case. He is the major point of contact for coordinating all care um, and establishing relationships with civilian sources, being a sounding board and the subject matter expert when it comes to advising all commands and um, any family members they call with questions. Um, he assists the commanders in developing kind of implementing actually the prevention strategy uh, activities and programs, as well as all the training. Well said. So thank you very much for that, Val. And what we know is that in our military work environments, we do have these advocates. We have the SARC, we have the victim advocate, um, and that is a lot on the post side of an incident, right? So they, they do go hand in hand. We want to prevent, we want to intervene, but should there be an incident, we have these um, people ready to stand in the gap for the victims to be able to help with the survival process of it and to help with the criminal justice process of it as well. Um, we did have some questions come in and I wanna acknowledge that we are running close to time, what we said, but I also want to say that we're going to be here for as long as the conversation is ongoing. So please continue to feel free to stay with us if you have the time permitted. Um, if you do not, you will be able to see anything that you miss on our recording that will be on the 82nd Cabs YouTube channel. But to get to those questions, um, we had an opportunity as you registered to drop in a question or a comment. And so I'd like to go ahead, and if you're okay with that, Dr. Orchowski, go ahead and start asking you some of these. Okay. Um, so one of the questions was, what advice would you give to junior leaders as to what is the most important slash immediate step they can take to create an environment that is sexual assault and sexual harassment free in their unit? So that's mm -hmm. a great question, because that's what we're talking about, not our squad, protect our squad. Mm -hmm. So how does a junior leader do that? You know, and oftentimes junior leaders are really frontline supervisors, really important in terms of creating connections with soldiers. You know, you might be the person that soldiers are going to with questions and concerns. So I think it's vital that junior leaders really have a positive outlook when it comes to some of the current training initiatives of it, viewing these things as important standing up as a leader to say that this is an important issue and that I really hope that everyone benefits from it. And if there are things that you feel aren't covered in the training that you're getting, please let me know so I can help you. I, I think that that personally standing up and saying that you care about an issue, it communicates to others that you're someone that they could come to if they have a question or concern. And it also communicates a, a climate that mm -hmm. doesn't tolerate injustice, harassment, assault. Right, you're creating the blueprint for what's acceptable <laughs> and more importantly, what is not acceptable behavior within your group. Um, so I think that's really very powerful because it is a lot of times from what you were telling us, the research indicates it's those younger soldiers coming in, maybe coming from that um, party culture from a college or the, you know, younger ones that maybe have come from an environment where it was more free flowing and um, alcohol may have been more involved and they're coming into an army values culture, right? And we are upholding the values of our military service. And it is a very big change for a lot of people. So it's that, that junior soldier, that junior leader has the opportunity to really affect a, a career, right? To set them off on a path. Um, so great question. I do have something that came in that I want to acknowledge. Um, we have Muriel who says that um, I am a brigade SARC for the 95th Civil Affairs Brigade here at Fort Bragg. Thank you for joining us. 
Um, I want to point out that the SARC also assists our, our sexual assault and sexual harassment victims while they are deployed. And that's a great point because we know that the numbers indicate that deployment can be an opportunity where we see spikes um, in these incidences. It's very important all my service members know how to reach back for advocacy if and when needed, even just for consultation. Great point, so thank you for adding that to it. Um, another question, this one's, this one's a good question. Uh, knowing what you know as a researcher in this field, would you feel comfortable if you had a daughter who told you she wants to join the military? What advice would you give her in regard to sexual assault and sexual harassment prevention for herself if she did indeed join? That is a great, great question. And, you know, I, I recognize that the U.S. military is not alone in facing issues of sexual assault. It is just one institution that is within the United States facing this problem. And young adulthood and adolescence, whether individuals are going to high school or college, there's risk of sexual assault there too. And, and so I, the advice that I would give is that we would be having these conversations early on um, and having kind of, um, you know, if I'm talking to um, women oftentimes are socialized not to speak up um, women are often socialized um, to be less assertive in communication, um, especially in sexual communication. And those are the kind of boundary setting skills mm -hmm. that can be really useful in navigating a situation where you're feeling pressured um, or someone is encroaching in your space. So in order to prepare for you know, risk of harm, whether an individual is, you know, going off to a summer camp or going off to college or entering military service, I think we can prepare our young girls in very similar ways. Right. Uh, recognizing that whatever environment that we're in, um, you know, we need to be aware of signs that someone is pressuring us um, and know what we can do in those situations. Absolutely. And I think the same is true. I mean, the question was about a daughter, but I think the same is true for a son because we know that there are same-sex sexual assaults and sexual harassment. And there's also the female that is the perpetrator as well, on, uh, to a male as well. Yep. So I think that that dynamic is something um, that goes for all genders. Um, so the next question is, what role, if any, does the military hoo-ha culture play in military sexual assaults and harassment? I think you touched a little bit on this when you were talking about co college culture and male culture, but what is the military HUA culture that, you know, I'm tough, I'm rugged, I can do anything, strap my boots on and I got yeah. this. Does that play a part? Hypermasculinity um, is one way to think about it. And if we look at research on um, what are the correlates, what are the things associated with sexual aggression, we do see um, groups that are high in hypermasculinity having higher rates of sexual aggression. And we also see that adherence to hypermasculinity supporting, like this is how I need to be, that's also personally associated with having a higher likelihood of, of engaging in sexual aggression. So I think to the extent that we can understand hypermasculinity, which is kind of this very stereotyped um, uh, vision of what men are quote, supposed, supposed to be. It's, it's a mirage, right? <laughs> um, to that extent, we do see database links between hypermasculinity and rates of sexual assault. And I want to take a moment to also acknowledge uh, my friend Krista Anderson. Thank you for joining us today as a representative from the Army Emergency Relief Fund. And she says, I know I always chime in on an Army Emergency Relief comment. But there is a program that we want to make sure, in case you're not kept reading the chat, the AER has a program that can relocate an active duty military spouse and children if they are the victim of domestic violence. It's a grant through AER. Um, and AER's first priority is to make sure everyone's safe. So I do want to make sure that we're voicing that into the room as well so that everybody's aware of that. Um, at this time, we have a couple more questions that I really would like to see if we have anybody that would like to speak into the room and have some discussion, open up for questions, for some verbal um, back and forth dialogue with anybody in here. 
And feel free to take yourselves off mute. Or if you'd rather put it in the chat box, you can as well. So Lindsay, we have one that came in, a question. How do you respond to those who say that leaders should know soldiers well enough to identify behavior that might lead to aggressive acts or sexual harassment slash assault? Two parts. Can the leaders identify who is more likely to commit these acts? So it sounds almost like the question is, you know, how do they identify, how do they know well enough to identify, um, and is there, for lack of a better term, a profile um, that a leader can look for? How do you answer that question? Yeah, what we've seen, and there's this is broadly in the field of um, you know, talking with criminologists, you know, is there a profile that, you know, we can use to predict violence? And so broadly in the field of criminology, we know that it's very difficult to predict when and who is going to be violent. Um, and I think the same applies to being able to understand who can engage in sexual aggression. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that a leader could identify who could perpetrate. Um, I, you know, I think if we can't do it with data, <laughs> then I think it would be really difficult to expect us as humans with feelings and relationships with people to be able to have that kind of predictive ability. Right. And I, I think from my point of view, um, I bring everything into resilience training and, and emotional intelligence training, but for me, it's about developing that relationship, right? Um, you do, of course, have that good guy phenomenon, good bad mm -hmm. phenomenon. However, if you're developing a true relationship with those people, maybe in your pod, in your squad, your neighbors, um, you will pick up on that, right? You're going to start noticing people's personalities, traits, and all that. So it does take that relationship building, which sometimes is really difficult whenever we are in a high op tempo. And um, for those of us here at Fort Bragg, we know what a high op tempo is like. Sometimes it's hard enough just to make any relationships with the people you live with, um, but it's really important if you're looking at, am I protecting my unit? Am I protecting my squad? The best way to know that is to develop those relationships, number one, so that you can help identify it yourself, but also number two, so that you create a, a, a safe environment that has trust involved so that if there is something going on, something hinky that's going on and affecting people within your unit, you have already created a relationship and that trust is there so that they will come to you, whether it's one or multiple people, but they will feel comfortable coming to you to have that discussion. And I think that that relationship building is key, acknowledging that we can't do it at every level, but certainly we do it at the smaller levels. Um, and it just yeah. takes that um, from every level, you have your tight squad that you have, whether you are a little group of paratroopers or you're up to, you know, the 18th Airborne Commander. You have a, a group of people that you entrust um, and that you give that trust to. Yeah. So we have um, another one that says, pay attention to their behavior, how they talk to others and act around others. Very good point. Any other questions? All right, we have, Harry, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Sorry, yeah. just a quick question. Um, how, how would we start the conversation with our children? I know that's probably a kind of a, a big topic, but yeah, so, um, you know, without and tre treading lightly without, you know, scaring them, but then also making sure that they're aware. Cause I know that, you know, in our household, we, I, I just, I could eat my kids, right? I love them so much. And, um, and, and we've gotten calls from the teachers. That's like, oh, you know, your son patted so-and-so on the bottom at school. And I'm like, oh no, he definitely gets that from me, right? So trying to make sure that they understand. Um, I mean, obviously I just need to stop doing that, but like what age, I guess. Yeah, there, and there are some really great resources online for kind of thinking about different developmental times and what's appropriate to talk to kids about at different times. 
Um, one of the things I'll say that is, is helpful is thinking about how you talk about bodily boundaries and also about agreeing to do something. So this notion of consent, bodily boundaries, um, what I want and don't want about my body and I get to choose that is something that you can talk to with kids at various different ages. Um, and then thinking about consent, um, you know, I am a researcher, but a mom as well. And so these are some of those times where as a preventionist, you know, if, um, you know, my kids are saying, well, no, I said no. I'm like, yes, they said no. <laughs> really jumping in to um, emphasize that when someone says they don't want something, we take that seriously. Um, and kids are often very disempowered. Um, and sometimes as parents, we're in this difficult bind where a kid says, no, I don't want to do that. Well, you know, guess what? We all have to get in the car and go to this place. <laughs> so sometimes with kids, there's a difficult dynamic and that can be confusing for them. Um, you know, well, sometimes you, you say, well, when I say no, that matters. And but here you're telling me I have to get in the car because we need to go. Um, so being able to think through those different dynamics about the word no and setting boundaries and communicating what you what you like and don't like and then listening to what other people say about what they want and don't want. Those are some really great early conversations that set the interpersonal stage very early on. Great point. Great question. Thank you. Great. Um, so that brings me back to this, the conversation that you're having about the research programs here ongoing at Fort Bragg. Um, and this that conversation that people are having. Do you find that it is in these opportunities to have the conversations and have the dialogues that we can truly affect change? I do. <laughs> I do. Um, there's, I, I think especially because for many of us, um, many of us perhaps given our age on this call, this wasn't a topic that we talked about a lot. Um, I remember when I started getting back involved in this research, um, you know, right around um, kind of early 2000s, um, there were even, you know, research advisory boards that says you can't ask a question about sexual assault. Um, you know, now this is really a topic that we recognize we need to talk to each other about. Um, that we have maybe silenced for too long. Um, and, you know, we need to talk to each other about um, the pressures that our pressure people are facing, um, the, the ways that we can do a better job at intervening. Right. Um, all of those things really are, are difficult things that we want to reflect about and we want to talk to each other about. So I think there's such value in conversation. Absolutely. Powerful stuff. Um, I want to go ahead and acknowledge the fact that Maria shared with us that the Fort Bragg ACS has a program for talking to your children about this topic and you can contact them and there's also a class. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine if Fort Bragg ACS has it, it's probably an Army Community Services program. So I would definitely encourage anybody who might have that question to check out that resource. Thank you, Maria, for sharing that with us. Um, I know we are over time, so I want to see if anybody else would like to ask a question, um, make an observation, address a concern that you may have. Um, talking about conversation being a great intervention and prevention measure. Um, does anybody have anything else that they'd like to add? All right, I'm not seeing anything at this time. Um, so a military one source also has resources. Absolutely. That's one of the first places I always check is if I have a question, military related, family related, check out military one source. Um, I, I do want to thank you so much for being with us today. It's a huge honor to have a, a researcher, a scientist of your caliber coming with so much knowledge to share with us. And I want to acknowledge the fact that we capped out on our participants um, this is just a little program that we've been doing here in the brigade and um, we've steadily been building. So any of you who may know of people that weren't able to join us, first and foremost, please express our apologies. Um, we're going to look at trying to expand the bandwidth or capabilities of having more. But I think it's a testimony to the fact that 
Dr. Rotrowski, so many people want this information, that this is a topic that we know is wrong, right? We know sexual assault and sexual harassment is wrong, just like you said, but sometimes we struggle with how do we take what we know and act upon it? How do we take what we know and create communities that are safe? And I think that so many people wanted to hear this today. And the fact that we maxed out is a testimony to the fact that um, what you were bringing today is a value, a value to our military communities, a value to communities across the world. This is not, like you said, and thank you for acknowledging that, that is not just a military issue. It is a human being issue, right? Um, so thank you for being with us. To everybody who joined us today, like I said, and I've said a couple of times, this will be on your 82nd Cavs YouTube channel, or you can check any of our social media sites and we'll have the link to that directly. The slides that Dr. Archowski prepared for us, she's generously allowed us to um, offer those to you guys. So you will be able to have these slides with all of the research information documented on it, all of the citations on it as well. So um, I really appreciate the fact that you are sharing that with us. And we will also add military resources for our military communities added to that. So please check this out. Um, I'd like to just close by thanking you again, thanking everybody for joining us and then turning it over to you to see if you have any last words. Yes, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about this topic. I, I agree, this is a sign of, of strength and a community of compassion that there are so many people here today to talk about this issue. So I, I hope that there was useful information. It was truly my pleasure to be a part of this conversation. Thank you very much. All right, well, goodbye everybody. Thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you the next session.